Hello and welcome to this third video from Chalice for the Language of Bells project. In previous videos, Ibi and Sam have introduced the viola consort and a solo instrument. But in this video, Kate and I would like to tell you about the actual instruments we play in Chalice. We often hear a lot about performers and composers, but less about the beautiful instruments through which the music comes to life. And we aim to redress the balance here. If you play a member of the violin family, it's possible to walk into any good instrument shop and be offered a selection of lovely antique instruments in addition to brand new ones. And many professional musicians play superb old instruments. However, very few viol players play on antique instruments and there's a good reason for this. Viols fell out of fashion in the latter half of the 18th century and many old instruments were cut up and used to build other instruments. For example, bass files often had new necks fitted to convert them into cellos, and we actually have a colleague who has one of these. And of the old instruments that do survive, many aren't in their original condition, having been modified as fashions changed, and there were even forgeries made as it became desirable to collect older instruments in the 19th century. The majority of older instruments are now in museums or private collections, and very few players are fortunate enough to own one. So what do the rest of us play on? Most viol players play on modern instruments, largely made in the second half of the 20th century and this century, and they're built by incredibly skilled craftspeople. These viol makers will either create instruments based on original viols or design their own models. There are two ways of acquiring an instrument. You can either commission a maker to build a new one or look for one that's already made or secondhand. And the viols we have here represent both of these options. Kate and I both play on instruments made by the fabulous German maker Renata Fink. In 2006 or 7, I commissioned Renata to make me a consort bass viol based on an instrument made by Henry Smith in 1637. It's very special as a musician to work with an instrument maker to have an instrument built especially for you. Indeed, Samuel Pepys mentions several visits to see his viol maker, Mr Hunt, in 1663. On Friday the 24th of July of that year, he wrote, And so up and down to many places, among others to the vile makers, and there saw the head, which now pleases me mightily. Pepys's mention of the head is to do with the carving at the top of his vial. Vials were most often owned by wealthy individuals, and it was commonplace for them to have their vials decorated in various ways, usually by ornate carvings or inlays. Members of the violin family almost always have solid, plain scrolls. Viol scrolls, on the other hand, are pierced, like this one here, and can also have beautiful carving added to the scroll. But many viols have a head carved on the top, and some of the requests can be very imaginative, from elephants to unicorns and pipe-smoking men. Here are a few examples. I love the beauty of leaves, and when I commissioned my consort base, I asked Renata to make a carving of an unfurling fern for the scroll. What she created is utterly beautiful, and we now refer to this as the fern vial and send each other photos of ferns we discover on our travels. Renata also teaches vial making on short courses at West Dean College in West Sussex, where my dad has been making vials for many years. He started with a small bass vial for my mum, then asked me what I'd like. I said I'd like a violone, a large bass vial, and thus began a labour of love, which led to this beautiful instrument here. It's very nearly finished, and I hope to be able to play it with Chalice in concerts next year. has an unusual carving at the top. It's based on the statue of a dragon which we saw on a trip to Hampton Court together and it was fantastic to see it emerge from the block of wood over time. I'm a really lucky lady. 
Dan's now making a tenner vial, which is probably light relief after making something of this size. So Renata so created Jenny's vial specifically for her, but my tenor was already in existence when I began my instrument search. Often in life, it's a friend who introduces you to your future partner. And in this case, it was actually Jenny who heard that Renata had a tenor vial for sale and put me in contact. Beforehand, I begged and borrowed tenors from friends and colleagues, and I remain hugely grateful to them for lending their instruments so generously. At the beginning of my search, I visited the Early Music Exhibition in Blackheath, where a massive number of makers gather with different instruments on display, almost like speed dating for vials. But although I saw some lovely tenors and trialled a few for a couple of weeks, I didn't find anything that totally clicked. So when Jenny mentioned that Renata had a tenor vial available, having heard her fantastic bass, I was really keen to try it. I liked the sound of the instrument from the start, particularly the singing tone on the top strings and the fact that it speaks so immediately. But the deciding factor was that it blended with the rest of the consort, which convinced me that it was the one. And I guess that that ability to try an instrument in context is one of the key advantages of buying a vial that's already made, as you can really hear how everything will sound. Later on, Renata and I met in person on the South Bank, near the Tate Modern, and discussed everything about the vial, from cases to stringing. It's been wonderful to talk to her about it and ask her advice, and to hear the story of this instrument from the maker's perspective too. So those are our experiences of finding vials as players. But what is it like for the maker to work alongside a musician in creating an instrument specifically for them? We asked Renata to tell us. Hi, my name is Renata. Making musical instruments is the most satisfying thing I can think of. I initially started out as a musician myself, but I could never get to groups with stage fright, so I turned to making viola da gambas. This is great, because through my instruments I still get up on stage, but someone else does the playing. There are two ways of making an instrument. A musician approaches a maker, or sometimes it is the other way round and commissions an instrument. It is always an honour when this happens, but at the same time there is the challenge and some trepidation of meeting the expectations of the musician. Each musician has a concept of sound, but to put this concept into words is not so easy. My task is to transfer this concept into making an instrument that will live up to what the musician has been hoping for. When Jenny approached me with her wish of a concert bass with a phone scroll, I was excited. I had met Jenny a few times through her parents and felt an immediate connection. We both have a love of nature, an eye for shape and form, and we both adore phones. Jenny is very enthusiastic and open-minded, so we basically went on an exploration of vial shapes and fern fronds together which was huge fun and still connects us to this day. Carving something like the fern scroll is really a unique one-off thing to do and it's huge fun because um, it gives joy to others and also to myself, of course. Jenny was also very clear how she wanted this bass to sound and although there is never a guarantee when working with some lively material such as wood, I was pretty certain I could get close to her ideal. Handing over the instrument was of course a very nervous moment, as was me listening to Jenny performing on it for the first time. The fact that she still loves and plays the instrument is very satisfying. I don't think I could make a good instrument for someone I don't get on with. While I make to commission, I think a lot about the musician who ordered the instrument, how they play, how they move, and the conversations we had. Kate's tenor came into the world in quite a different way. It will probably remain the only instrument of mine someone else has had a hand in it. It was made when Alexandre Tremé worked with me as an employee and he expressed an interest to learn about vials, so we made it together. I occasionally make instruments without a commission. It is a very free way of making. There are no expectations, other than my own, of course. No pressure to get things finished for a certain date. And there is the joy of following my own ideas and to experiment and to learn. 
In fact, this tenor model is my own design. It is not based on an extant instrument, but strongly influenced by my understanding of English viols. I feel that every maker has his or her own voice which they give to their instrument. Each instrument I make without an order will find its musician eventually, and it is always exciting to me to see who this musician will be. When Jenny told me that Kate was looking for a vial, um, I had the chance to send my tenor over through a friend of mine so that Kate could try it. When the news came that she had approved of the tenor and that now two of my instruments would be played in Chile's concert, I wanted to meet Kate in person. So on my next trip to England, we arranged to meet up and this was a very happy day. I feel that Jenna tenor has chosen her very well. My only wish now is to hear Chile's concert perform live in concert, but because we live in different countries, this has never come to pass yet. But surely one day it will, I hope so. So we've told you about the instruments that Kate and I play in Chalice, but we've asked the other members of the ensemble to introduce their vials and explain how they met them. This is my tenor vial, or actually not my tenor vial, but the tenor that I am lucky enough to be loaned to play in Chalice. It's made by a chap called Michael Metcalf who, having made several really beautiful vials, decided it was maybe time that he learned to play them. So I met Michael as a very new viol player on a course a good number of years ago. And from the very first moment I heard him play this tenor, I absolutely loved the sound. And a few years later, he came on another course, but with a different tenor. And we were chatting about the vials that he'd been making recently, and he was playing the new tenor vial. So he said, it means that the old one doesn't really get played so much anymore because I'm, I'm busy playing in this new one. So I wondered, um, would you like it for a bit? It would be nicer if it lived with you and got played than, than lived with me. So incredibly generously, this is the tenor that I've been playing in consort ever since. It's really, really beautifully made and you can see fantastic head carved on the top. Slightly unusually and maybe ambitiously, and actually Michael said he would never ever do this to a vial again. It's got fantastically ornate pegs and a really beautifully decorated peg box. And the other thing that I particularly like about this instrument is on the back. Very fancy purfling design. I cannot imagine how many hours of craftsmanship went into the making of this. And it's just a particularly beautiful piece of wood. Fantastic stripy pattern across the back. So that is my tenor. Unlike Ali's wonderfully ornate tenor vial, this is a relatively plain instrument, but I do love its sound. So it hasn't got a carved head like Ali's instrument. This has got a plain scroll, but wonderfully carved by the maker. And on its back, no purfling, but a beautiful piece of wood. This instrument was made by the wonderful Japanese craftsman called Kazuya Sato. And Mr. Sato travelled to London with another instrument that he had made on commission. And he thought he would make the trip more worthwhile by bringing an extra instrument to see if anyone would like it. And that person was me. I instantly fell in love with the wonderful sound and the thing that I love about the sound is that it has both viol and violin-like quality about it so a wonderfully versatile instrument and um, as I said in uh, one of the earlier films about uh, film about the viols in the consort uh, I have the wonderful opportunity to play tunes on this instrument uh, in the group. This is my bass vial. It was made by Jane Julia and it's a copy of an original instrument from around 1649. Uh, it's got a, a very ornately carved head um, and the head is a, a, the, a copy of a, an original vial head uh, that's found on a rose bass vial. Um, and it's thought to be Kalamos, who was a, a mythological Greek mythological figure um, who, when his lover Karpos died, uh, drowned in the river Meander. Uh, he drowned himself in his despair. 
uh, and was turned into reeds. And the, the whistling of the wind through the, through the reeds was said to have been uh, like the music of a lament. So quite an appropriate uh, interpretation for a, a bass file whose role later in the 17th, 18th century was often uh, associated with uh, Elysiac music. Um, uh, it's a, a very big bass. It's got a very deep um, set of ribs, uh, which makes it quite a powerful um, powerful instrument, so it's really good for playing bass lines, but it's also quite a, a, a nimble sound, so it's you can play faster passages and, and things like lira music on it uh, very effectively. Uh, so yes, this is a really fantastic instrument to be able to play in consort. One thing we haven't mentioned is bows. Once you've found your instrument, there comes the quest for the ideal bow to match it. And again, one can either commission a bow maker to make a bow, or try out a multitude of different bows, for example, at the early music exhibition. A bit like Harry Potter going to Ollivander's shop to choose his wand. It's amazing what different sounds different bows can draw out of the same instrument, and how tiny adjustments to bows can make real differences to their sound and balance. We thought we'd finish with a little duet on Renata's vials for you. This is a short fantasia by the French composer Nicolas Metru which gives a taster of some of the French repertoire that Chavis will be exploring in a project this winter. We'll be posting more about this on social media and the Chavis website soon. And please do visit the dedicated site for the Language of Bells project for updates and to get involved, www.thelanguageofbells.com. Mm -hmm. 